थैंक यू सो हेलो माई डियर ऑफ माई डियर स्टूडेंट्स आई होप आई एम विजिबल एंड ऑडिबल एज वेल प्लीज लेट मी नो इन द चैट बॉक्स एंड देन वी कैन स्टार्ट आवर सेशन टूडे सो रविंद्र राय इज सेंग हाई सो डॉक्टर अमित परवार इज सेंग हेलो गुड इवनिंग वेरी गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर अमित सो आई होप माई ऑडियो एंड माई वीडियो इज ऑल क्लियर इफ दैट इज ऑल फाइन देन आई कैन जस्ट स्टार्ट विद द सेशन नाउ इज इन डेट प्लीज कन्फर्म वंस थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच सो वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू दिस लाइव सेशन अबाउट डर्मेटोलॉजी रैपिड रिविशन विथ पी डब्ल्यू मेडेट so i hope the entire sprint series was of great help for all of you i mean you must have revised all those subjects which was already done in the last few days so we had started from anatomy and now we have reached till dermatology i hope your revisions is going on in a good track now how many days is remaining for your exams hmm i don't want to scare you right in the beginning of the session so number of days remaining is just hardly 2 weeks right so with just 2 weeks remaining for the exam i don't want to make the entire session way too complicated वैसे भी डर्मेटोलॉजी इज अ कूल सब्जेक्ट सो वी डोंट वॉन्ट टू मेक कॉम्प्लिकेटेड थिंग्स इन डर्मेटोलॉजी सो आई एल जस्ट लेट यू नो वॉट इज माई प्लान सो बिफोर दैट लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस माई सेल्फ आई एम डॉक्टर जजीर अब्दुल कादर सो आई एम योर डर्मेटोलॉजी फैकल्टी एट पी डब्ल्यू मेडेट एंड आई एम सो ग्लैड दैट वी ऑल आर टूगेदर इन दिस लाइव सेशन टूडे सो दैट वी कैन हेल्प यू विथ योर रिविशंस एंड आई होप दैट यू ऑल विल कम आउट इन ग्रेट फ्लाइंग कलर्स okay so thank you so much yes medico fever dr deepan shu all of them are saying just 14 days hi mohit thank you so much yes we have met so now what we will do is now let us uh, slowly start of the session now what is my plan today is in this entire session of dermatology rapid revision we have few questions which was asked in the previous year exams so we will be talking about the previous year questions at the same time we will just go through all the options and we'll also try to cover the remaining topics as well because you know that maybe questions are not repeated but topics are definitely repeated isn't it so we'll try to complete all the important topics within a short span let us say within 2 to 3 hours of time so that you just know all the important ones that you should never miss before going for the exam so is that clear so i think uh, yes medico fever sarang neelam bhatia so all of them are responding so thank you so much if that is all clear now let's begin with the first question ready chalo so now let's see the first question now that a 15 year old girl presents with itchy lesions on her arms as shown in the image her family history is positive for asthma what could be the most probable diagnosis so just go through this question right now 15 year old girl presents with itchy lesions the lesions are itchy and where is it shown in the image so in the image what you should always try to understand when you see an image is where is the rash so where is the rash present is it over the flexural surface or is it over the extensor surface so yes so it is b so many of them are coming to the right answer that is atopic dermatitis excellent so how are you able to say that this is atopic dermatitis all of them are answering it right excellent good going now tell me why is this atopic dermatitis what is the main reason and i have circled the image now and that is the biggest clue that you have yes so rangesh is saying healthy pill is saying all of them are telling the right answer because the rash is present over the flexural aspect now let us see what happens in atopic dermatitis a quick revision of atopic dermatitis for you this thing called atopic dermatitis we usually call it as ad okay and what happens in atopic dermatitis this is a chronic inflammatory condition of the skin it is a chronic inflammatory condition of the skin now what happens in atopic dermatitis is the presentation is going to be entirely different according to the age now here the most common symptom is that there is going to be a itch scratch itch cycle 
So what happens when somebody feels that the skin is going to itch, you'll be scratching over the skin. Once you scratch over the skin, again the itch will continue. That is itch, scratch, itch cycle and that is seen in atopic dermatitis. And what is the type of skin? Is the patient going to have a well hydrated skin or the patient is going to have a dehydrated skin or a dry skin? What do you think? Yes, Mohit is answering there is a history of atopy as well. Excellent Mohit. So along with that you can see a dry skin plus a history of atopy. So what is atopy? Atopy means allergy. So these are the patients who usually may be having some kind of an allergy. What are the allergy? This allergy can be either allergic rhinitis, allergic rhinitis or it can be bronchial asthma or it can be bronchial asthma. So very good. Sarang, Shreya Kumari, Vikash Verma, all of you are answering. So remember for your exams, atopic dermatitis means it is going to be a patient with a dry skin and these kind of patients will also give you a history of a personal history or a family history of atopy. So in this family history or personal history of atopy, what all comes? Allergic rhinitis, hay fever, I mean uh, bronchial asthma, all these would come. Now what is the difference according to the area where the rash is seen? This is very important. So please don't make a mistake in this one. In case the MCQ says that the age is since birth to two years of age, then the rash is seen over the face and the extensor surface and the extensor surfaces so hay fever yes all of all of you are getting it right excellent so remember that in this case if the question says it is a one year old child who complains of a rash over the face and the mother is a case of bronchial asthma same question but the age is different. So in that case, in up to two years of age, the most common site would be the face, the scalp and the extensors. Whereas when it comes to the other category, that is more than two years of age to adults. In such cases, the most common site is going to be the flexures. It is going to be the flexures. So this is the most important key. Got it? So I hope, uh, yes, very good Neelam, Bhatia, Rahila, all of you are getting it right. So remember that this is a very important topic which you will not miss for your NEED PG exam. That is atopic dermatitis, very frequently asked and repeatedly asked. And please make sure if the age is less than two years, always go for scalp, uh, the, the face and the extensor surface. And if the age is uh, more than two years, always go for the flexural aspect. Now, who can tell me what is the most common site of atopic dermatitis in adults? All of you know it is flexures. Can you be more specific now? Like which is the most common site? So this one, if you ask me what is the most common site, the answer would be, I'm just waiting for your reply in the chat box. Who can answer? most common site of atopic dermatitis in adults it is definitely flexures but what is it more specifically yes so this is going to be the anti-cubital fossa so this is going to be the anti-cubital fossa very good so that is all about this question that is about atopic dermatitis. So I hope that things are fine. So all of you are able to follow. If that is all fine, then let me go to the next one. Very good Shreya Kumari, Rankesh. So all of you are answering it well. So chalo. So let's go to the next one. Now let us see this question now. A patient Bindi leukoderma is caused by which chemical? So they have given you the diagnosis here. The diagnosis is Bindi Leucoderma. Leuco means white. Derma means skin. So there is a deep pigmented skin in this image. So let me zoom this image for you. So what do you find in this image? That the central part of the forehead has turned white in color. So this central part. So what is going to be the culprit? The culprit is going to be Bindi, isn't it? Now, they have asked you, like, what exactly is the reason behind it? So, the chat box is filled with D, 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 D. So, what is the right answer? Excellent. This is para-tertiary butyl phenol. 
PTBP. Now, what is this para tertiary butyl phenol? What what role does it have to play in a bindi? What is it used as? Who can answer? What is it used as? Yes, all of you are right. So whoever is answering it as D, everything is right. Yes, it is used as a adhesive. It is used as a adhesive or a glue. So this is the gum or it is a glue that is used in the case of <coughs> bindi dermatitis. Okay, in the case of bindi dermatitis. Now we have other options in the MCQs as well, like monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone, uh, crosserin scarlet mu, and uh, para paraphenylene diamine. What are these used for? Now let us see. Very good. So all of you are answering it right. Now let us see this image. <coughs> so in this image, what do you find? What in case last time in the exam they asked you bindi dermatitis, this time they can ask you something like this. In this image, what is the culprit now? You can see that there is an area of the skin that has become depigmented. Abhi yaha pe culprit kaun hai? What is the culprit here? So Mohit is saying in chappal. Okay. So in chappal, yes, this is going to be because of rubber slippers. Okay. This is going to be because of rubber slippers. So Mohit is right up to that. What about the other one? What is the problem here? So here, please remember, in case of rubber slippers, here the answer would be monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone. Okay, MBH. So please note down, here it is going to be due to monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone. So this is a very potent depigmenting agent and this is going to be the right answer when it comes to a rubber slippers. Now going to the next one, what is the culprit in the third image? In the third image, you can see that somebody had a graying of the hair and because of the graying of the hair, they used a hair dye. Ab kya hua? After using this hair dye, the entire skin has become depigmented. So again, chemical leucoderma. Now what is the reason or the culprit of a chemical leucoderma when it comes to a hair dye? Yaha pe, this is going to be due to hair dye. And here, yes, all of you are writing the right answer here. Here the right answer is going to be either PPD, that is paraphenylene diamine, or it can sometimes also be PTBC. Who can tell me what is the abbreviation of PTBC? PTBC. Very good. Dr. Dipanshu, Faria, all of you are answering. Very good. So what is the answer here? That is going to be PTBC is para tertiary butyl catechol. Okay, para tertiary butyl catechol is going to be the culprit. So that is about chemical leucoderma. So remember, whenever the, whenever the skin turns hypopigmented or depigmented, because of contact with a chemical, it's called as a chemical leucoderma. And we learned about three things today. That is, bindi dermatitis is caused due to PTBP. Then uh, rubber slippers can cause due to monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone. And hair dyes, the culprit can be PPD and PTBC. Okay? Okay, done. Now let's go to the next one. The most common triggering factor of the given condition is. So what is the most common triggering factor of this given condition? The options are vaccination, malignancy, drugs and infection. Now guys, don't jump into the answer initially. First thing, whenever you get an image, always at least give it a try to describe the lesion. Okay, at least give it a try to describe the lesion. And once you describe the lesion, I'm sure that some clues will come to your mind. Ki ha, diagnosis could be this one or the other one. So what is the diagnosis here? Who can tell me the diagnosis? Yes, Rangesh is saying that this looks like a target lesion. How many of you agree that it is going to be a target lesion? Yeah, very good. So see, now what happens here is, so this is called as a target lesion. This is called as a target lesion. Now in this target lesion, what you can see is, in the center, you can see a erythematous plaque lesion, followed by there is a rim of erythema. There is a rim of erythema. So these kind of lesions, they are either called as a target lesion, or it is also called as a bullseye lesion, 
or it can be called as a iris lesion it can be called as a iris lesion so target lesion iris lesion bullseye lesion all these things are the same thing called for what is the condition it's called as erythema multiforme it is due to erythema multiforme so many of you are answering that this kind of a target lesion can be caused due to drugs now you tell me that is drugs going to be the most common cause or is it going to be some kind of an infection that can be the most common cause because the question says the most common triggering factor so are we always going to have a side effect of a drug or is it more likely that a patient can have some infections what could be the most common yes the most common could be an infection so please remember all of you you are not completely wrong so what you have to focus here is there are multiple reasons of erythema multiforme so this erythema multiforme can be either caused due to an infection or it can be due to drugs or it can be due to drugs now when it comes to infection and drugs the most common infection the most common infection is with dash who can answer what is the most common infection associated with erythema multiforme where the patient presents to you with target lesions so what is the right answer uh rangesh please remember lyme's disease lyme's disease means there you can find target like lesions okay there you can find target like lesions it is caused due to borrelia burgdorferi now we are talking about target lesion which is seen in erythema multiforme so both are going to be entirely different fine so i'm just correcting you whenever you are going wrong so don't get disheartened okay it is very good that you guys are trying in the chat box so keep trying so now out of all these things what is the most common cause of infection in erythema multiforme here the answer would be hsv okay it is going to be herpes simplex virus infection and one of the other infection is mycoplasma mycoplasma and drugs me matlab so many drugs can cause this type of a erythema multiforme reaction but remember the most common cause is going to be the infection with herpes simplex virus we kyunki herpes simplex is very common isn't it so whenever a patient can get a herpes simplex infection so at that time he is more likely to have a erythema multiforme as well so the most common overall would be an infection with hsv so in some cases there can be an infection with mycoplasma that can also be a trigger and definitely like all of you have said in the chat box very correctly drugs can also play a role in the formation of erythema multiforme fine so so with your permission i am going to move to the next question so coming to the next question a young female presented with a vaginal itching and a green frothy genital discharge strawberry vagina is seen on examination what will be the drug of choice what will be the drug of choice so usually what happens in the exams they can either ask you a genital ulcer disease or they can ask you regarding a genital discharge disease so when it comes to genital discharge so all of you must be knowing that it can be either a urethritis or some vaginal discharge so when it comes to a vaginal discharge here what are the clues that you have got so so yes in the chat box you guys are answering it is so many of them like ivabradine uh, neelam bhatia lakshmi so all of you are answering it as metronidazole and some of you are telling the diagnosis as trichomonas vaginalis excellent super now why is trichomonas the diagnosis now before we go into this diagnosis let us see what are the types of vaginal discharge first theek okay? hai so let's see what are the types of vaginal discharge so either in candidiasis trichomoniasis and in bacterial vaginosis in all these conditions you can get a vaginal discharge i hope all of you agree now what is a type of discharge that you can see in candidiasis in candidiasis what is the type of discharge that you can see so who can answer in the chat box i'm waiting for you guys to answer so type of discharge that is seen in 
candidiasis. What is the color? White. And what is it compared to? Curd, isn't it? Curdy white discharge. Excellent. So this is going to be curdy white discharge. So this is going to be curdy white discharge. So very good. Neelam, Ivabradin, Lakshmi, Shreya, Sakib, Mohit, all of you are answering it as curdy white discharge. Now candidiasis, it is, is it bacterial or is it fungal? So candidiasis by the name itself, no, you know that it is going to be fungal. So in such cases, you can treat it with antifungals, especially fluconazole 150 mg stat, isn't it? So that is going to be the treatment. Yes, Sakib. Very good, Sakib. So now let us see what is the discharge that you can see in trichomoniasis. Now trichomoniasis, may you can get a green frothy dis discharge, green frothy discharge. So this is what was mentioned in our MCQ, right? So today, so just now in that MCQ, they mentioned about the green frothy discharge and trichomoniasis is now a bacterial infection. So it is okay for us to treat it with either secnidazole or we can treat it with metronidazole. Or we can treat it with metronidazole since it is going to be a bacterial infection. Very good. Now coming to the last one, one more type of vaginal discharge. Now what is this? Bacterial vaginosis. Abhi bacterial vaginosis mein what is the type of discharge that you see? Does it have something to do with the smell? Yes. So what is the smell? It has a fishy odor, isn't it? And white scanty discharge is seen. So you get a white scanty discharge with a fishy odor okay it smells like a fish so that is a fishy odor and a white scanty discharge again it is usually a treatment is not necessary but in case you're going for a treatment then what you can do you can go for a metronidazole isn't it very good so yeah amcells criteria whiff test fishy order so you guys are typing all that you know about bacterial vaginosis because there is a change in the ph in the vagina and because of which this kind of discharge is done is is being seen so you don't consider it as an infection isn't it usually so yes very good so that is how we have completed the fourth question so excellent now let's move to the next one Yes, see all these images, the entire annotated PDF shall be shared to the PW Medit Telegram group. So after the class, I'll be sharing the same PDF to you so that you can just go back and revise, have a quick revision as well. Fine. So chalo. now let us see what is correct regarding the diagnosis of the given image. Now, what is the thing that you can see in this image right now? Hmm? You can see there is a background erythema, isn't it? Over this erythema, you can see there are multiple vesicles, isn't it? And then can you also notice that these kind of vesicles, are they crossing the midline? No. So there is some multiple vesicle that is grouped vesicles on an erythematous base on a dermatomal distribution. Why dermatomal distribution? Because the lesions are not crossing the midline. Abolo, what is the diagnosis? Is it herpes zoster? Is it herpes simplex? Is it human herpes virus 7 or human papilloma virus? Yes, so this is going to be due to herpes zoster. Now, what is herpes zoster? What happens in herpes zoster? So, in herpes zoster, there is a re reactivation of varicella virus there is a reactivation of varicella virus because of which i'll just write down what is a typical presentation and this should be written in red isn't it it is a very typical presentation where the patient can present to you with grouped vesicles on erythematous base on dermatomal distribution on dermatomal distribution so since I'm mentioning it as a dermatomal distribution, the lesions are usually seen over a nerve root, isn't it? So this is going to be, it is not going to cross the midline. So they do not cross midline. They do not cross the midline. 
So this one herpes zoster is also called as shingles. It is also called as shingles. Now I have one more question to ask you. Now just imagine that you have a patient who had herpes zoster. What is the most common complication that is associated with herpes zoster? Because the patient is going to present to you with this kind of a skin. And in the skin you can see an erythematous background and grouped vesicles on a dermatomal distribution. Now what is the most common complication? That is my question. So who can answer? I am just waiting to see your answers in the chat box. Chalo, answer me in the chat box. So the most common complication is going to be very good. So Evabradin is answering it as post herpetic neuralgia. Dr. Reformer is answering, Kishore Kumar is answering, Neelam Bhatia, excellent. So this is going to be post herpetic neuralgia. So you all know that herpes zoster we can treat it with acyclovir, isn't it? Now what is, what are you, how are you going to manage this post herpetic neuralgia? So the question is what is the drug of choice in post herpetic neuralgia that is associated with herpes zoster? Now who is going to answer this one? Yes, so here the drug of choice is going to be gabapentin, gabapentin. So this is going to be the drug of choice for the management of post herpetic neuralgia which is the most common complication associated with herpes zoster. Very good. So Priya is answering, Neelam Bhatia, excellent. Science lovers, all of you are answering it right. Sakib is also answering it. Excellent. Good going. So I hope things are fine now. So with your permission, shall I move to the next topic, to the next question? So please let me know in the chat box if everything is okay. Should I slow down a bit or should I go in the same pace as I'm going right now? Okay, so let us see what is the diagnosis that is seen in the image below. What is the diagnosis? So people are answering it as C, C. So, okay, go same. Fine, thank you Priya. So, Dr. Reformer, Vicky Smart, Dr. A, Dipanshu, all of you are answering it as C. So, mostly people are answering it as Candidial Intertrigo. Now, let us see one by one. Okay, now let us see how to manage this, see this type of a question. So, what is the diagnosis? It's a direct question. So, the first one they have asked, Candidal Paronychia. So, now let us see what is Candidal Paronychia first. So this is an image of a paronychia. So what do you mean by paronychia? Paronychia, it means there is a inflammation or infection of the lateral nail folds. So whenever there is an infection or an inflammation of the lateral, so this is the lateral nail fold. So whenever there is an infection or inflammation of the lateral nail fold, you call it as a paronychia. Now this paronychia, it can be either acute paronychia or it can be a chronic paronychia. It can be an acute paronychia or it can be a chronic paronychia. And in most of the cases, acute paronychia usually follows some kind of a trauma. Like just imagine that you got your fingers got stuck in between a door. And then after that you started developing this kind of a painful lesion over the lateral nail fold. It's called as paronychia and acute paronychia is going to be caused due to staph aureus. It is usually caused by staph aureus. Whereas chronic paronychia is usually going to be a mixed infection. Mixed infection and mostly this is going to be fungal more than bacterial. It is going to be fungal more than bacterial. So these are the differences between acute paronychia and chronic paronychia. So in case you get an image like this where there is an inflammation of the lateral nail fold and if you can see some pus beneath it, it is going to be paronychia. Okay? So now let us see what was the another option that was given in the question. The second option was staphylococcal scalded skin. Now what is this? 
staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome like this one so this is called as staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome we call it as 4s 4s staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome this usually happens whenever we partially treat any staphylococcal infections so this is seen in partially treated staph infections so in partially treated staph infections usually kya hota hai when you don't treat a staphylococcal conjunctivitis when you don't treat a normal boil or a furuncle then this staphylococcus can enter into the blood they can release toxins in the blood and there will be a massive desquamation massive peeling of the skin so let us keep it simple massive peeling of the skin this type of a massive peeling of the skin can be seen in this image can you see this image where there is a baby who is having a massive peeling of the skin that is a most common presentation in staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome but please take one more point here that in staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome there is no mucosal involvement so there is no mucosal involvement like a child who had a a staphylococcal infection now presents with high grade fever along with massive peeling of the skin without involvement of the oral mucosa or the genital mucosa then the diagnosis is going to be staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome fine and how do we treat this case we can treat this case by antibiotics because that is the causative is ultimately staphylococcus and since there is a massive peeling of the skin we can also go for some fluids as well so ritter syndrome so that is what priya is asking see the staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome is also called as pemphigus neonatorum pemphigus neonatorum it is also called as ritter's disease okay ritter's disease so don't get confused with ritter syndrome what is ritter's Reiters is reactive arthritis. You must have learned, isn't it? Reiters is reactive arthritis. Here, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome is Reiters disease. R I T T E R S. Reiters disease. Fine. Now, can anybody tell me one clinical sign in dermatology which can be elicited in this baby? Any one clinical sign. For example, Ospit sign, Darrier sign, Nikolsky sign. and hutchinson sign which is a type of sign that can be elicited in this baby so just imagine that i am applying a tangential pressure over the skin and the skin peels off now what is this sign called as the sign yes in the chat box please so this sign is called as nikolsky sign okay nikolsky sign okay very good so that is about nikolsky sign so madhavan kutti rangesh neelam bhatia all of you are answering so that is called as nikolsky sign now now let us go back to the question now so what is the diagnosis so definitely it is not candidal paronychia definitely it is not staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome and the last one is diabetic foot ulcer there is no mention of any ulcer in this mcq as well so the right answer here would be candidal intertrigo so intertrigo what is the meaning of this term intertrigo so intertrigo or intertrigenous area means body folds so whenever a patient develops a fungal infection in the body folds like in between the fingers or in between the toes it is called as intertrigenous infection that is candidal intertrigo now remember this is the most common fungal infection in washer woman it is the most common fungal infection in washer woman or housewives or housewives so remember see uh, housewives and all who are always washing 
clothes, uh, washing the vessels. So they are always in touch with some detergents, dishwash, etc. So they are more likely to get some infections because they are always the skin is immersed in water, isn't it? So they may complain of this kind of an infection that is candidal intertrigo. This is the most common infection that you see in a washerwoman or housewives. It's called as candidal intertrigo. So in between the folds, in between the digits. So here the answer is C. So now let's move to the next question. So this next question is, which of the following is commonly associated with the condition shown below? <coughs> what is the answer here? Which of the following is commonly associated? Now in the options you can see oil drop sign, leukonychia striata, pterygium of the nails and pitting of the nails and pitting of the nails. So in the option, they have given you four options that is four findings over the nails. And the question is about some hair loss that is seen over the scalp. So many of them are answering it as D. Some of you are answering it as A. So is it oil drop or is it uh, pitting of the nails? Now let us see what is the right answer. Fine. So first tell me what is the diagnosis in this image? So in this image, you can see there is a patchy hair loss in the scalp. There is a patchy hair loss. So whenever there is a patchy hair loss, what is the diagnosis? <coughs> yeah. So whenever there is a patchy hair loss, it, the diagnosis is going to be alopecia areata. Alopecia areata. So here the diagnosis is alopecia areata. Now let us see what are the important findings in alopecia areata. So this image will give you all the three very important findings in alopecia areata. Now what is the first one? The first one is called as pitting of the nails. So all of you got the right answer of the MCQ, right? So in the MCQ also the answer should be pitting of the nails, not oil drop sign. So in pitting of the nails, we can get a regular and shallow pits so regular and shallow pits so these are going to be regular and shallow pits Matlab, there are some depressions over the nails so this is the most common type of a nail finding that you can see in alopecia areata now coming to the next one what is the second very important image in the second image is been labeled as emh now what is emh So this surface or this is go going to be called as exclamation mark hair. So this is called as exclamation mark hair. So what happens in exclamation mark? This is the exclamation mark. So the outside part of the hair is going to be broader. And the hair that is close to the scalp is going to be thin. And this is called as an exclamation mark hair. Also a very important finding in alopecia areata. Now what is the third image? Very good. Adarsh, Nida, Neelam, Eva Bradin. All of you are answering it right. Exclamation mark. Now what is the third one? In the third one, there is a patchy hair loss. But in this patchy hair loss, the patient has lost all the black hair. There is a retention of the white hair. Now this is a phenomenon. Means in the, in the patch, patient lost all the black hair. White hair is still there. The white hair is remaining. So this is the patch and black hair is lost, white hair is remaining. Now what is the sign called as? This sign is called as the turning grey phenomenon. So this is called turning grey phenomenon. So these are the important findings in alopecia areata and this is an autoimmune condition. It's an autoimmune condition. That is alopecia areata. So remember all these important points when it comes to alopecia areata. Now in the MCQ, they also mentioned about oil drop sign. Now you must be wondering where is this oil drop sign usually seen? Isn't it? So you can see the image as well. So this is an image of an oil drop sign in the nails. Now who can tell me in which disease can you find this oil drop? Because this is a very characteristic nail finding in this disease. So who can answer? 
Yes, Rangesh. In the case of alopecia areata, it is going to be a non-scarring type of alopecia. I agree with you. So, Adarsh, Rangesh, Kishore, Mohit, all of you are answering it right. This is seen in psoriasis. So, in psoriasis, Shreya Kumari, Neelam Bhatia is also answering. Excellent. So, in psoriasis, what you find is oil drop sign. And this is a most characteristic nail finding. It is a most characteristic nail finding now I, I wanted to ask you one more question now what is the most common nail finding in psoriasis can anybody answer this what is the most common nail finding in psoriasis so in psoriasis the most common nail finding would be is it oil drop sign or is it something else so yeah i'm just waiting for your answers in the chat box <clears throat> what is the most common nail finding the most common nail finding is going to be pitting of the nails pitting of nails just like what you see in alopecia areata but in the case of uh yeah Eva, so Eva Bradin is answering uh not subungual hyperkeratosis yeah some of you are getting it right like shreya is also getting it right adarsh is also getting it right Dr. Sanju is getting it right. Excellent. So here this is going to be pitting of nails once again. But the exact opposite type of pitting happens like what you can see in alopecia areata. Alopecia areata mein pitting is going to be regular and shallow. So here it is going to be exact opposite like irregular and deep pitting. Irregular and deep pitting of the nails is seen in psoriasis. Take care. Now what is the last image? Now what is this image? There is a patient who is having this kind of a nail finding. So in this nail you can see that there is a wing shaped extension of the nail into the nail bed. Now what is this wing shaped extension called as? And what is it usually called? So who can answer this one? Yeah, whoever has answered psoriasis, excellent. I have agree with all of you including Dr. Megavi, Dr. Nida. So now, yeah, Neelam Bhatia, Adar, Shreya, Rangesh, all of you are answering. This is called as pterygium of the nails. Pterygium of nails. And in which disease do we find pterygium of the nails? This is seen in lichen planus. This is seen in lichen planus. Very good. So this is seen in lichen planus that is pterygium of the nails. Now before I go further just one more question and then this thing is done. Now if I ask you the same question what is the most common nail finding in lichen planus? Who can answer? What is the most common nail finding in lichen planus? Because it is an MCQ right so they can ask you here and there. The most characteristic would be pterygium. Now what is the most common? Uh, Pupton sign is seen in lichen planus, but that is not the most common. White, sticky, fishy order, discharge. See, uh, regarding the discharge, I'll just get back to you later. Now, let us fo focus on this uh, MCQ. So, the most common nail change in lichen planus is going to be thinning of the nails. Okay, it is going to be thinning of the nails. Okay, very good. So, that is all about this. So in this MCQ, what is the right answer? With alopecia areata, the commonest association would be pitting of the nails. It should be pitting of the nails. Chalo. Next one. Identify the condition that is given this image. Now what do you see in this image? You can see that there is a patient whose axilla is being shown. And in the axilla, you can see that there is a hyperpigmentation. And the texture of the skin has also changed, isn't it? So there is a velvety type hyperpigmentation of the skin. Now look into the options. See how is my approach to the dermatology MCQs? Whenever there is a question about the image, I'm directly looking into the image. I'm trying to give my own inference regarding this image. So in this image, before looking into the options, I was able to make out that a patient's axilla is being shown. There is some hyperpigmented patch lesion, okay, and there is some change in the texture to the skin. That is a velvety type texture. So, 
Yes. So the answer is filled up in the chat box. Metabolic syndrome seen in diabetes mellitus, acanthosis nigricans, insulin resistance. So here the answer is going to be acanthosis nigricans. Acanthosis nigricans. Now who can tell me what is the most common association of acanthosis nigricans? So because in the chat box itself there were a lot of people telling about metabolic syndrome somebody was telling about insulin resistance metabolic syndrome x uh, diabetes mellitus but people are missing out on the most common association what is the most common association the most common association is going to be obesity fine so neelam is also getting it right sauvik rakshit is also getting it right excellent so the most common association is going to be obesity and along with obesity many other conditions like metabolic syndromes can also be seen okay very good now in this options you can see that there was one of the option which was mentioned as melasma do we get this kind of hyperpigmentation over the axilla or do we get it somewhere else in melasma now let us see what is melasma first ye melasma this is the exact image of a melasma now how do you find melasma you can see a brownish hyperpigmented isn't it is it a macule or a patch that you can see in melasma the size of the lesion is big the size is more than 1 cm so this is going to be yes so this is going to be a brownish hyperpigmented patch over sun exposed areas over sun exposed areas why am i mentioning it as sun exposed area because the main reasons that someone may get melasma it can be either due to sun damage that is somebody who is not using proper sun protection with sun creams isn't it the second one can be due to hormonal changes hormonal changes like some patient who is taking oc pills isn't it or sometimes in pregnancy now tell me what is the name of melasma in pregnancy so this question is for you melasma in pregnancy is called by another name it is also mentioned as a mask of pregnancy so what is the other name for melasma in pregnancy so this is called as cloasma dr sanju is answering this is cloasma excellent dr sanju so this is called as cloasma dr sauvik dr priya dr mohit all of you are able to answer it's called as cloasma now what is the drug of choice in the case of melasma the drug of choice in melasma we can use many skin depigmenting agents so the options that i will give you is azelaic acid kojic acid chemical peeling and uh, hydroquinone so what is the drug of choice when it comes to melasma yes the drug of choice when it comes to melasma is hydroquinone so hydroquinone is a drug of choice in melasma so excellent i hope i have explained everything in this uh, mcq so now let's go to the next one okay going to the next one see uh, dilpreet uh, regarding a permanent treatment of cloasma see cloasma is means it is just a mask of pregnancy which appears during pregnancy because what happens in pregnancy the entire hormonal uh, the ratio is going to change isn't it so after pregnancy what happens once there is once the birth is given to the baby so the entire pigmentation of the skin will come back to normal once the hormone level will come back to normal fine so nothing is required when it comes to cloasma whereas in melasma in people like me and you so whenever there is a hyperpigmented patch that is developing then we may have to go for treatment fine but no treatment is necessary when it comes to cloasma usually fine now identify the drug that is used to treat the condition shown below now you can see a very weird image that again this image is over the axilla of the patient okay and you can see the the options are anti fungal therapy anti tubercular therapy topical steroid therapy and anti leprosy therapy what do you think is the right answer dr sanju says lupus vulgaris mohit says satellite lesions 
Anyone else? Who else would, would like to give it a try? It's okay of making mistakes today. So that we'll make mistakes but we will also learn today. Fine? Who else would like to give it a try? So Sanju is saying go for anti-tubercular therapy. Now let us see. So just see this image. So what you what, what can you see in this image is there is how many plaque lesion? There is only a single plaque lesion. So there is a single plaque lesion which probably would be present over a period of time. And then in the center you can see that there is some area that has been left out. Okay, probably there is a central clearing or a central scarring. And in the uh, edges there is some raised edges as well. So from this image, it less likely looks like a tinea infection because what happens in tinea infection, you get that ringworm, right? So rounded lesions with peripheral scaling and all with raised edges. So here it is not, doesn't look like a tinea infection. And to, to give topical steroids, it doesn't look like an eczema as well, isn't it? So we can rule out this one, we can rule out this one. Now we are left with anti-tubercular therapy and anti-leprosy therapy. In leprosy again, we do not find this kind of a scaly lesions, isn't it? What do you find is a hypopigmented patch lesion and depending upon the type of leprosy, it can be either looking like a saucer right way up, sometimes it can look like a Swiss cheese appearance etc. But this doesn't fit into the type of lesions that you see in leprosy as well. So the right answer here would be going for a anti-tubercular therapy. Anti-tubercular therapy. And what is the diagnosis here? The What is the name of the most common type of cutaneous tuberculosis? So what do you call for the most common type of cutaneous tuberculosis? The most common type of cutaneous tuberculosis is some vulgaris. What vulgaris? Because vulgaris means most common. So most common type of cutaneous tuberculosis is lupus vulgaris. So this is going to be lupus vulgaris. So in the case of lupus vulgaris, this is the most common type of cutaneous tuberculosis of the skin. So for how long do we have to treat a patient of cutaneous tuberculosis? Anyone? The duration of treatment? So the options are 6 months, 9 months, 12 months, none of the above. Yes, so all of you are answering it as LV, that is lupus vulgaris. Now, what is the duration of treatment that is necessary? Treatment would be required for 6 months. The treatment is required for 6 months. Very good. Science lovers, Megavi, Sadik, Sudha, Shukla, Sri, all of you are answering. Excellent. Now, let's move to the next one. So in this question, identify the finding that is associated with the condition shown in the image below. Now we can see that there is a part of the skin where there is a deep pigmented lesion, isn't it? And doesn't it look like somebody had scratched over the lesion and the patient developed something like this, isn't it? So what is this called as? What is this phenomenon? Now let us see the options. The options are isomorphic phenomenon. Meyerson phenomenon, Gottron's papule and Nikolsky sign. So yes, who was the first to answer? I need to scroll back. So all of you had answered about six months about tuberculosis. Excellent. So Neelam, Mohit, Reforma, Shreya, Megavi, Tarakanta, Das, Sanju, all of you. So all of you are answering it as isomorphic phenomenon that is Cobner's phenomenon. So this is very correct isomorphic phenomenon or Cobner's phenomenon. So let me just write down what is Cobner's phenomenon. So Cobner's phenomenon. So what happens here? New skin lesions develop, new skin lesions develop at the site of trauma. So new skin lesions develop at the site of trauma. So whenever there is a trauma, like somebody scratched over the skin. So in, in all these cases, or if we have done a biopsy over the skin, at that uh, area of trauma, the patient may develop a new skin lesion. Now, what are the common diseases where you find this Cobner's phenomenon or isomorphic phenomenon? Isomorphic phenomenon. So this isomorphic phenomenon is seen in LVP. 
Now what is L? L is lichen planus. V stands for vitiligo and P stands for psoriasis and P stands for psoriasis. Along with lichen planus, we can also see it in lichen nitidus. So L, V, P are the diseases where we find Cobner's phenomenon or isomorphic phenomenon. It can be seen in lichen planus, lichen nitidus, vitiligo and psoriasis. Now from this image, can you tell me the diagnosis now? What would be the underlying skin disorder in this patient? Is it lichen? Is it vitiligo? Or is it psoriasis? Is it lichen? Is it vitiligo or psoriasis? Do your guess right now. So Dravidan, Neelam, Shreya. What is your what is the diagnosis? Very good. This is vitiligo. Reason? You can see a depigmented patch over the skin. Depigmented patch over the skin. Now quickly we will also see what are the other signs that was mentioned in the MCQ. In the MCQ, they mentioned about Gautran's papules. Now, what are Gautran's papules? These are the papules or these are the erythematous plaque lesions that you see over the joints, okay, over the knuckles, over the interphalangeal joints. So, what are these called as Gautran's papule? Now, quickly tell me in which disease do we find Gautran's papules? So, Gautran papules are seen in which disease? So, yes, Neelam, it is gotten papule. Up diagnosis, brother. Yeah. So, Dr. S.S. Reformer, all of you are answering. This is seen in dermatomyositis. It is seen in dermatomyositis. Excellent. Very good. Yes, Dr. Dibanshu, shawl sign, holster sign, and then all these signs are seen in uh, in the case of dermatomyositis. Okay, shawl sign, holster sign, Gautran's papules, heliotrope erythema, violaceous rash over the face. All these things are seen in dermatomyositis. Now let us see what is this one. They also mentioned about Nikolsky sign, isn't it? So whenever you apply a tangential pressure, if the skin peels off, it's called as Nikolsky sign. So in Nikolsky sign, what are the diseases in which you can find Nikolsky sign? Can somebody answer? What are the diseases where you find Nikolsky sign? One disease, abhi abhi, we have done. What was that? That was a child who had a massive peeling of the skin without involvement of the mucosa. So that was Staphylococcal Scandard Skin Syndrome, isn't it? Now, what is the other diseases where you can find Nikolsky sign? The other diseases where you can find Nikolsky sign is, yes, Dr. Megavi, you can see it in Pemphigus vulgaris. So this is seen in Pemphigus vulgaris, also can be seen in Pemphigus foliaceus can also see it in pemphigus foliaceus as well. Excellent. Very good. So in the chat box, some of you were answering about dermatomyositis. Yes, in dermatomyositis, it can be associated with malignancy. So you have to rule out a malignancy. There is a proximal muscle weakness as well, which is very correct because the patient can complain of weakness of the uh, leg when they're climbing the stairs, weakness of the arms when they're combing the hair, isn't it? All these are the common symptoms. Excellent. So let me go to the next one. Identify the finding that is shown in this image. What is the finding? Options are herpes labialis, herpangina, molluscum contagiosum, impetigo. Now what do you see? So the first answer to come is from Dr. SS. Dr. SS says it is A. So Mohit is answering, is asking about pseudo Cobners and reverse Cobner. I'll get into that in a while, Mohit. Okay, so according to the chat box, most of them would like to go for herpes labialis, which is again the correct answer. So what is herpes labialis? Herpes labialis. Yes, uh, Dravidan, I'm going to explain you about it. Fine. So in herpes labialis, what you can find is there are two lesions here where there is how does a patient present they present with a grouped vesicles on erythematous base so patient may present with a grouped vesicles on an erythematous base and these vesicles can get eroded as well so in this image more than a vesicle you can see an erosion on an erythematous base 
So this is most likely to be caused by herpes simplex virus type 1 and HSV type 1 infection of the lips is called herpes labialis. It is called herpes labialis. Now in this option there are many other diseases also mentioned. Now let us try to understand what are those diseases and how do we differentiate from each other. So let us see the first one. So this first one in case it is a child who usually presents to you with fever plus aphthous ulcers or vesicles in the oropharynx then what is the diagnosis this is usually called as herpangina this is herpangina so whenever a child presents to you with fever along with painful aphthous ulcers mouth ulcers or some vesicles within the oropharynx then the diagnosis can be herpangina and what is the causative of an herpangina it can be caused by coxsackie virus can be caused by Coxsackie virus can be caused by a Coxsackie virus the second one is very good in the options itself you are answering in the chat box so Madhavan Kutti Neelam all of you good now what is this the second one is a spot diagnosis actually so there is a child usually who is presenting to you with the dome shaped umbilicated papules can you see that there is a small depression in the center in all these papules so these are dome shaped umbilicated papules so this is called as molluscum contagiosum isn't it very good Yuvraj is answering Neelam JK so this is molluscum contagiosum so in this molluscum contagiosum you can see there is one more sign that like probably this is a child who got this lesion first and since that child must have touched this lesion and touched the adjacent skin there is an auto inoculation of the virus to the adjacent skin and because of which multiple lesions are developing one after the other now what is the name of this phenomenon this phenomenon is called as pseudocobner's phenomenon very good dr dipanshu this is called as pseudocobner or pseudo isomorphic so earlier it was isomorphic phenomenon LVP now this is pseudo Cobner where there is an appearance of new lesions because of auto inoculation of the virus that is seen in molluscum contagiosum and in the third image what you can find in the third image is there is a, again a patient who presents with golden yellow honey colored crust now where did you learn about golden yellow honey colored crust so in the question in the MCQ in the image if you can see a golden yellow honey colored crust the diagnosis becomes impetigo so here the diagnosis becomes impetigo okay <clears throat> excellent See Dr. Megavi, like a pseudo Cobner's phenomenon, more than chickenpox, the example would be like human papilloma virus warts. Because chickenpox, whether you touch this lesion or not, it is anyways going to be a generalized eruption. Fine, there you cannot call it as a pseudo Cobner's usually. So now this is called as impetigo, where there is a golden yellow honey colored crust. So please have a good differentiation of all these skin lesions. So shall I move to the next one? Yes. So Dravidan is saying that this impetigo, the image which I have shown, so that is not a bullous impetigo. So this is a non-bullous impetigo. What is the causative of non-bullous impetigo? Is it streptococcus or is it staphylococcus? More likely. So more likely here it is going to be strepto more than staph. Okay, this is going to be strepto more likely than staphylococcus aureus. Whereas in bullous type of an impetigo, the causative is more likely to be staph aureus. Okay, very good. Now this question is more like integrated with the pharmacology. Okay, it is a direct question. Like which of the following drugs can be used as a nail lacquer which belongs to morpholins? Which belongs to morpholins group? So what is the answer here? Yes. 
So nail lacquer, which means in the case of onychomycosis, or in the cases of tinea unguum, okay, in dermatophytosis and all. So what we can use is we instead of using a tablet or instead of using any ointments, can an ointment stay over the nails just like it stays over the skin? No, right? So these days nail lacquers has come. So these nail lacquers can be applied just like a nail polish. Okay, so because of that, there is a better patient compliance and better result as well. So what are the examples of nail polish or a nail lacquer that is available these days? These are going to be Amarolfin and Cyclopyrox. Olamine. Okay, Amrolfin and Cyclopyrox olamine is present is uh, now available as a nail lacquer which can be used to treat fungal nail infections. So among all these things from the name itself, okay, that is which belongs to Morpholins. So Morpholins is going to be Amrolfin. So this is going to be Amrolfin. So these are various antifungal agents. So once you get this annotated PDF, please go through all these antifungal agents to which class do they belong to. Okay, so out of which here it is properly mentioned that Morpholins is going to be Amrolfin. Okay, Morpholins is going to be Amrolfin. Now going to the next question, that is, a child was born with membranes around the body and he had ectropion and eclabion. He is brought to the OPD with the lesions covering his face, trunk and extremities. Which of the following is an unlikely diagnosis? Unlikely diagnosis. So please read the question carefully because always they ask you which is the most likely diagnosis. Now here they have asked you which is the most unlikely diagnosis. Now let us see this image. So in this image you can see that there is a small baby and this baby is having a very dry skin. So there is an eversion of the eyelids and even the skin around the oral mucosa is not formed properly. So which means there is ectropion and eclabium, isn't it? Now, what is the most unlikely diagnosis? Now concentrate on all the options now. First one is ichthyosis vulgaris. Second one is lamellar ichthyosis. Third one is bathing suit ichthyosis and the fourth one is harlequin ichthyosis. So what do you think is the most unlikely diagnosis? Saumya Deep is saying A, Dr. SS is saying A, many of them are saying C. So this is A versus C. Now let us see what is the right answer. Some of them A, some of them C. So before we go into the answer, let us try to understand what are the types of ichthyosis. Okay, now, now focus here, not in the chat box. Now what are the types of ichthyosis? Ichthyosis means this term ichthyosis it means fish like scaling okay it means fish like scaling of the skin so whenever the skin looks very dry it looks like a fish like skin this is called as ichthyosis now there are basically three types of ichthyosis that is ichthyosis vulgaris x-linked ichthyosis and lamellar ichthyosis and unfortunately, all these things are going to have a different inheritance. Now see, ichthyosis vulgaris is autosomal dominant. X-linked ichthyosis is going to be X-linked recessive. Whereas lamellar ichthyosis is going to be autosomal recessive. Now that is different. Now, even the defect is different. So in, uh, in ichthyosis vulgaris, there is a defect of filagrin. In the X-linked ichthyosis, there is a defect of steroid sulfatase. And when it comes to lamellar ichthyosis, there is a defect of transglutaminase 1. Transglutaminase 1. Now, ichthyosis vulgaris, you will never make a mistake if you get an image. The, the reason is, this is usually seen over extensor surface. This is usually seen over the extensor surface. I'll quickly show you one image as well. Just see this image. So this is an image where the patient is having a dry fish like scaling of the skin over the extensor surface. Abhi diagnosis kya hai? This is going to be ichthyosis vulgaris. This is going to be ichthyosis vulgaris. Now coming back to the second type. 
X-linked ichthyosis. I do not have a picture of X-linked ichthyosis today. But in X-linked ichthyosis, remember that there is flexures plus extensor involvement. Which means both the flexural surface and the extensor surface can be involved. And this is associated with hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation. Or there is a darkening of the skin that happens. Okay? Now, what is the third one? Autosomal recessive condition where there is a defect of transglutaminase 1. Now, here the baby is born with a membrane at birth. See, remember now the MCQ? The MCQ mentioned the baby was born with a membrane at birth. So, this is a condition where a baby is born with membrane at birth. And this type of a baby is also called as collodion baby or a collodion membrane collodion baby or a collodion membrane now let us see this image now this is the membrane what I am mentioning about can you see that there is a baby there is a membrane coating over the skin so this is lamellar ichthyosis so in this type of lamellar ichthyosis what happens you can also see there is this membrane collodion membrane so after few days of life what happens this membrane automatically peels off so there is a baby who is born with a membrane and after few days of life this membrane would peel off once this membrane peels off what do you find you find a very dry skin so that is what happens now which is that worst type of ichthyosis that you can imagine the worst type of ichthyosis which is again a type of a lamellar ichthyosis or a variant which is also autosomal recessive in which you can find this ectropion, eclabion and the skin itself is not formed and you can see that the skin has some armor like encasement over the chest like somebody is going for a to fight a war isn't it so this type of baby has a typical name can anybody name so, Dr. Megavi is asking with a question mark. She is in doubt. Hmm? So, what is it? Neelam Bhatia is also answering. So, this is called as the Harlequin ichthyosis. Harlequin ichthyosis. Or the Harlequin baby. Okay, Harlequin ichthyosis or the Harlequin baby. Now, let us go back to the question. I hope all of you have understood about ichthyosis. Ichthyosis vulgaris. X-linked ichthyosis, lamellar ichthyosis and the worst type is going to be harlequin ichthyosis and even bath suit uh, ichthyosis is also going to involve the entire body. The only difference is it is like a bathing suit. So which part is not involved? The extremities and the face will not be involved in bath suit ichthyosis. Now let us go back to the question now. So in this question, which is the most unlikely diagnosis? Ichthyosis vulgaris, lamellar ichthyosis, bathing suit ichthyosis, harlequin ichthyosis. Now tell me the answer. The clue is vulgaris involves only extensor. Lamellar, bathing suit, harlequin mein pura body ka involvement hone ka chances hai. Now what is the right, right answer now? Yes, the right answer right now would be ichthyosis vulgaris. Because that is the most unlikely diagnosis in the scenario. Yes, yes, Dr. Reformer, ichthyosis vulgaris can also be seen in adults over the extensor surface. Over the extensor surface. So, very good, Dr. Priya. So, all of you are answering. So, this is going to be Ian Donald, Neelam, Creative Express. So, don't go for B. The answer is A. Okay, Dr. Sudha Shukla is also answering. Good. So, now let's move to the next question. So, in this next question, a 10 year old male child complains of a mild painful swelling over the scalp for 3 months and the image is shown below. He also has a pet dog at his home. What is the diagnosis? So what is it? So Dravidan is saying it is Kirion. Sandeep, Sandeep Shetty is, Reddy is also saying Kirion. Many of them are going for option C. Okay, option C. So I will also agree to you, this is again a called as a Kirion. So now remember, what are the typical features in Kirion? So Kirion is an inflammatory type of tinea capitis. Okay, Kirion is an inflammatory type of 
tinea capitis that is called as kirion now how does a patient usually present to you with kirion they usually present to you with tender boggy swelling of the scalp tender boggy swelling of the scalp and the patient may have a scarring alopecia this is a condition where a patient may have a scarring alopecia there may be some lymphadenopathy there may be some lymphadenopathy so a patient presents with a painful swelling of the scalp it is usually seen in a child and the patient can have some lymphadenopathy and this can also lead to a scarring alopecia and it is usually passed on this fungus is usually passed on to the humans through animals or domestic pets so there may be a history of domestic pets at home so all these are the important points regarding kirion which is a inflammatory type of tinea capitis understood so here the right answer is kirion now let us see what are the other options asked like furuncal folliculitis etc now how about quickly learning what is the basic difference between all of them now they can come as an image based question isn't it now a patient develops crops of pustules after shaving off or after trimming the beard hair now what is the diagnosis is it a furuncal or a carbuncle or a folliculitis so dr megvi i'll give you the entire list of scarring and non scarring alopecia just give me few minutes okay i'll give you so right now we are talking about a group of pustules that has developed and why these pustules have developed be soon after shaving of the beard hair or the trimming of the beard hair now this is called as folliculitis so this is folliculitis because there is a inflammation of a hair follicle now what do you call for this one the second one in the second image you can see that the skin has become swollen and red and it looks like there is some a uh, pus beneath the skin if there is some pus beneath the skin it is more likely we usually call it as a boil where there is a infection of a single hair follicle so this is infection of single hair follicle so the common name for this condition is called as a furuncle it is called as a furuncle now what is happening in the third image in this third image instead of a single hair follicle how many hair follicles is now infected multiple contiguous hair follicles are in infected so this is the infection of multiple contiguous hair follicle so when there is a infection of multiple contiguous hair follicle we can call it as a carbuncle we can call it as carbuncle okay and the most common site of a carbuncle is the nape of the neck and carbuncle is very common in diabetic patients as well okay so somebody was asking yes mohit so you can see sieve like openings excellent so in in carbuncle you can see multiple sieve like openings as well very good excellent so someone was asking about folliculitis versus tinea barbe see folliculitis versus tinea barbe it's a very good question isn't it so somebody has shaved off the skin and then the patient can find there is some lesion over the uh, beard part of the hair now in which of these will be positive for koh obviously koh is going to be positive when there is a tinea infection whereas folliculitis is it a fungal infection or something else folliculitis is usually caused by a bacteria what is a bacteria the bacteria that causes folliculitis furuncle and carbuncle the most common bacteria is going to be the same one that is staph aureus that is going to be staph aureus fine so that is about this question that is all about this question so i just wanted to add one more point as somebody was asking about the scarring and the non scarring alopecia so just note down when it comes to non scarring alopecia non scarring alopecia 
How can you remember the non scarring alopecia is anything that starts with A or anything that starts with T or let us say ATA. Okay, ATA. So, in ATA, what are the conditions that come like A and T? So, A stands for alopecia, areata is a non scarring alopecia. Then, another A is androgenic alopecia, androgenic alopecia. What is T? T stands for trichotillomania. Another T is going to be telogen effluvium and the last A is going to be anagen effluvium. So all these things are going to be an example of a non-scarring alopecia. Non-scarring alopecia. So please remember anything that starts with A or anything that starts with T is going to be or ATA is going to be the examples of non-scarring alopecia. Now can you quickly tell me in the chat box what are the examples of scarring alopecia? So some of the examples of scarring alopecia right now we discussed about Kirion. So, Kirion is one example of scarring alopecia. Any other example of scarring alopecia that is seen in lichen planus. So, lichen plano pilaris. Another example is discoid lupus erythematosus. Then we have dissecting cellulitis. Okay, all these are examples of scarring type of an alopecia. Okay, so please don't write it as SLE, it is going to be uh, discoid lupus erythematosus. Okay, discoid lupus erythematosus. So, yes, very well done. So, let me just proceed further. Done? So, going further, you can see that what there is a child with a history of night blindness presented to you with the following findings. So, what is a diagnosis? The options are Phrynoderma, Keratosis pilaris, Darius disease and Follicular eczema. So in which type of vitamin deficiency do we expect night blindness? So night blindness is usually expected with vitamin A deficiency, isn't it? Now whenever there is a nutritional deficiency, if the patient presents with multiple papular lesions over the elbow region. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is Phrynoderma. Phrynoderma. So excellent, all of you are getting it right. So in Phrynoderma, you have a Todd-like skin. So what is a Todd? Todd is a little frog. So you get a Todd-like skin when it comes to Phrynoderma. And this is going to be a cause of... Uh, this is usually associated with multiple vitamin deficiencies. So it can be seen with vitamin A deficiency, B deficiency, multiple vitamin deficiency. It can also be seen with essential fatty acid deficiency. Now, next question is, what is Phrynoderma not associated with? What is Phrynoderma not associated with? Options are vitamin A deficiency, vitamin B deficiency, vitamin C deficiency and vitamin D deficiency. Yes, it is associated with fatty acids also. So this is usually not associated with vitamin D deficiency. Okay, vitamin D deficiency. So before we go further uh, about uh, the new, from the, this topic of nutritional deficiency, please don't forget to read about Pellagra. So please don't forget to read about Pellagra. Because in almost all the exams in India these days, Pellagra is asked. Okay. So what is the deficiency that you see in Pellagra? Yes, very good. Maxwell, Neelam, all of you are answering. Vitamin D is not associated. Sakib is also answering. Very good. Now, can somebody tell me in what is the deficiency that you see in a condition called Pellagra? What is a vitamin? B1, B2, B3, B6, B12. Yes, Aravindan is saying there are four Ds. There are four Ds in Pellagra. That is one point. It is vitamin B3 deficiency. So, I am just writing down whatever you are giving in the chat box. So, somebody is saying there is a niacin deficiency. So what is the type of diet this patient is going to be? What is the type of diet? 
so this patient is mostly going to be a maize eater so what are the four d's of pellagra the four d's out of which the first d is diarrhea you have dermatitis you have dementia and in untreated cases it can lead to death now in a patient of pellagra if you get an image like there is a photosensitive rash around the neck it looks like a necklace that is a clue for you what is this necklace called as this necklace is called anyone yes maize tryptophan to niacin all of you are right now the question is what is the name of this necklace yes this is called as kazel's necklace this is called kazel's necklace now one more bonus question for you now in the same patient of pellagra may come to you with complaints of a shiny red color rash over the dorsum of the hands so what is this called this is also a sign so shiny red color rash over the dorsum of the hands this is called as gauntlet sign this is called as gauntlet sign so this is a very important topic that is the reason why i'm just repeating it that is gauntlet sign okay so yes thank you so let me just go further so i hope all of you have understood about pellagra as well so don't forget to revise regarding pellagra for your exams so let us do this uh, okay this is a big topic right pemphigus vulgaris so do you think that we should take a short break it's going to be 8 o'clock i hope that you all are able to follow i hope all of you are understanding what is being taught so all these questions are the previous year questions okay so as i can see that the next topic is regarding pemphigus okay the bullus vesicular bullus disease is a very important disease in dermatology right so i guess let us take a very short break so we will continue after about uh, 10 15 minutes fine no need <laughs> how many of you feel that a break a break is needed or how many of you feel like we should continue just let me know in the chat box see whenever there is a fishy order discharge and all it should be tested science lovers so you have to get it tested for any kind of an sti or what is the reason okay no need no need okay if there is no need of a break then uh, yes we'll continue without a break okay thank you so now let's continue so a 30 year old patient presented with a flaccid bulla on her on her skin which is easy to rupture the biopsy revealed a supra basal split it's not slit split so what is the most likely diagnosis pemphigus vulgaris foliaceous vegetans erythema multiforme okay so here the right answer since it is a supra basal split the right answer would be pemphigus vulgaris okay pemphigus vulgaris now that uh that poll is over regarding the break so please come back we are talking about this question now now when it comes to all the vesicular bullous diseases i want all of you to remember this one it's a very important slide this these are the five different clinical scenarios of vesicular bullous diseases if you always remember this type of a clinical scenario you will be able to answer any question that comes regarding vesicular bullous diseases now let us see the first one right now a middle aged patient presents with oral mucosal erosions and a flaccid bulla what is the diagnosis now this requires more of an interaction please come back yes mekavi saying vulgaris fishnet pattern nikolsky sign aspo hansen sign very good so whenever please remember in on the day of exam if the question says a patient has a bulla and the lesions started with the oral mucosal erosions the answer is going to be pemphigus vulgaris the answer is going to be pemphigus vulgaris excellent now let's go to the second question a middle aged patient who complains with of erosions and where is this erosion present over the seborrheic sites and there is no mucosal involvement there is no 
mucosal involvement. So when there is no mucosal involvement, the lesions are present over the seboric sites. What is the diagnosis going to be? Here it is going to be pemphigus foliaceus. Pemphigus foliaceus. Now let's see the sec third question. When there is an elderly patient, if the MCQ itself mentions an 80 year old patient presents with a tense bulla, now the term has changed. It is not flaccid anymore. Flaccid means breaks easily. Now there is a tense bulla. Now what is the diagnosis here? Now the diagnosis is going to be bullous pemphigoid. Bullous pemphigoid. Bullous pemphigoid. Very good. So Neelam Bhatia is also answering that is going to be bullous pemphigoid. Now see the next question. A little tricky but I'll, I'll give you a very good clue that you can crack any question that comes on this topic. Okay. Now it is a young patient who presents with itchy papulovesicles over the extensor surface and it is associated with celiac disease. Celiac sprue. But love, if that patient takes some uh, food, the symptoms are going to get worsened because that is going to be associated with celiac sprue. Now, how do you understand what is the disease here? Yes, Dr. Reformer is answering this is dermatitis herpetiformis. Herpetiformis. Now, why is the answer dermatitis herpetiformis? Hmm? So, the answer is dermatitis herpetiformis because here we did not talk about vesiculobullous disease. We spoke about papulovesicles. So please make a clear cut note that if the question says a child with papulovesicles over extensor, a young patient with papulovesicles over the extensor, a very old patient or an elderly patient with papulovesicles over the extensor, if it is papulovesicles, always go for dermatitis herpetiformis that is going to be the right answer now the last one now we are going to deal with a child a child presents with a tense bulla and this bulla is having a very typical appearance what is this appearance string of pearls appearance so where do you find string of pearls appearance yes in the chat box please string of pearls appearance is seen in linear IgA disease linear IgA disease it is also called as chronic bullous disease of the childhood chronic bullous disease of the childhood now we have cracked five different clinical scenarios of vesiculobullous disease in this one slide okay so there are some students who were asking some doubts let me just see the chat box once so the doubts was like seboric site most common is pemphigus vulgaris no See, seboric sites, it is always going to be pemphigus foliaceous. Dr. Megavi, it is going to be pemphigus foliaceous. In pemphigus vulgaris, it can be seen throughout the trunk. The first important point is pemphigus vulgaris, lesions always begin in the oral mucosa. Now, pemphigus foliaceous, the site is going to be seboric sites. Now, another one is gluten sensitivity yeah gluten sensitivity linear IgA disease yeah so Dravidin is adding one more point here that what is a drug of choice in dermatitis herpetiformis and IgA linear IgA disease who can answer other than Dravidin so the answer for the drug of choice in dermatitis herpetiformis and linear IgA disease these two diseases is going to be Dapson it is going to be Dapson. Excellent. So all of you are contributing more and more points to this revision. Very good. Excellent. So in this MCQ, the right answer is going to be Pemphigus vulgaris. Because Pemphigus vulgaris has a supra basal split. Now can you tell me what is the level of the split in Pemphigus foliaceous? Pemphigus foliaceous, the split is going to be subcorneal subcorneal split subcorneal matlab it is below the stratum corneum now what is a layer which is present in the stratum just below stratum corneum the layer that comes below stratum corneum is going to be stratum granulosum it is going to be stratum granulosum 
So reformer, Dravidian, excellent. So all of you are answering it right. So whenever IgA comes, then Dapsone is a drug of choice. Very good. So I agree to all of you in the chat box. Fine. So now let me go to the next one. So what is the treatment of choice in a patient with paronychia of the index finger? Abhi paronychia to already discussed kar chuka hai. So this is another time when paronychia was repeated. What is paronychia? There is the infection of the lateral nail fold. So what was the commonest organism causing paronychia? The commonest organism was Staph aureus. The commonest organism was Staph aureus. Now amoxiclav, metronidazole, amikazin, norfloxacin. Which is going to be more sensitive to Staph aureus infections. So the answer would be amoxiclav. Okay, this, is, this was an easy question. That is about uh, paronychia. Now let's see the next one. A patient is taking a multi-drug therapy. And presents with worsening of the existing lesions and nerve involvement. What will be your next best step of action? Okay, multi-drug therapy and patient is complaining that the existing skin lesion is becoming worsened. And there is some nerve involvement as well. What is the next best uh, step of action? Stop MDD, start systemic steroids, continue MDT, start steroids, stop MDT, give thalidomide, continue MDT, start thalidomide. So someone is like B, 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 B. Hmm? So Dr. Richapal is so confident about B. Dr. Dipanshu, Alain Raj, Vicky Smart. Good. So this is B. Now why is the answer B? Now what is the diagnosis here? The diagnosis here is a lepra reaction. The diagnosis here is a lepra reaction. Now there are two types of lepra reaction if you remember. Isn't it? Abhi lepra reaction mein what is happening? Type 1 lepra reaction was also called as reversal reaction and type 2 lepra reaction was also called as erythema nodosum leprosum. Erythema nodosum leprosum. Now type 1, what is the type of hypersensitivity? Type 1 is type 4 hypersensitivity and type 2 is type 3 hypersensitivity. How can I write so quick? Reason is 1 plus 4 equals to 5. That is how I remember. So type 1 is type 4 hypersensitivity and type 2 is type 3 hypersensitivity. Done? Now, what is the type of patients? That is, what is the type of leprosy patients who can show type 1 lepra reaction? So type 1 lepra reaction is shown by all the borderline types. Now, how many borderline leprosies are there? There is a borderline tuberculoid BT, BB and BL. So these are the three types of borderline types of leprosy which can show a type 1 lepra reaction. Now which type of patients can show a type 2 lepra reaction? Type 2 lepra reaction is shown by any patient who is having a lepromatous type of react, uh, leprosy. How many lepromatous type is there? There is BL and LL. There is BL and LL. Fine. Now what is the difference in the clinical scenario? The difference in clinical scenario is in type 1 lepra reaction, the existing skin lesions become inflamed like what was mentioned in our question today whereas in type 2 lepra reaction what do you find we can see erythema nodosum what is erythema nodosum where you get subcutaneous nodules over the anterior part of the leg where you get subcutaneous nodules you can you can palpate and see there will be multiple nodules over the frontal part okay anterior part of the leg that is erythema nodosum leprosum now in both these cases what is our drug of choice our drug of choice in both these cases is going to be steroids it is going to be steroids okay so steroids matlab prednisolone can be used for the treatment but remember, in type 2 lepra reaction, thalidomide can also be used. 
thalidomide can also be used in type 2 lepra reaction but that is not the drug of choice drug of choice in both these cases is going to be steroids itself so that is about lepra reaction so whenever a patient takes multi drug therapy a patient can show either lepra reaction 1 or lepra reaction 2 and lepra reaction 1 is mostly seen in borderline cases lepra reaction 2 is mostly seen in lepromatous type of leprosy now also one more point is lepra reaction is not a drug reaction so if it is not a drug reaction should we stop on multi drug therapy no so stop multi drug therapy stop multi drug therapy is definitely wrong now we have ruled out two of the options now we are left with two options continue mdt start steroids continue mdt start thalidomide what is the right answer here there was a worsening of existing skin lesions matlab type 1 lepra reaction so type 1 lepra reaction may you can go for option number b that is continue mdt and start steroids yes priya phacomelia is a side effect of thalidomide because that is going to be teratogenic excellent so it is nice to see that you add more points to all these topics excellent now let us see the next question that is a 30 year old male patient presents to you with inflammatory type of alopecia inflammatory alopecia which of the following variants of tinea capitis infection commonly results in this type of alopecia now first before i look into all these options let me just give you a simple thing okay uh, what if type 2 is given see Yuvraj in all these cases the answer was the same option about lepra reaction because lepra reaction is not a drug reaction so in both the cases you have to continue MDT and in both the cases you have to continue with steroids or start with steroids okay so that is the right answer so here some of you are answering it as C Many of you are answering it as C, some of you are answering it as D. Let us try to see. Tinea capitis. Tinea capitis. We can divide tinea capitis into two types. So what are the two types? One is inflammatory. The other one is non-inflammatory. So in the inflammatory, there are two examples. One example though we have already learnt. That was Kirion. Remember a child with a domestic pet at home and that child presented with a tender bogey swelling of the scalp. Now, second example of an inflammatory tinea capitis is favors. Your favors may you can see these crusted lesions over the scalp and this is endemic in Kashmir. It is endemic in Kashmir. Whereas the examples of non-inflammatory type of tinea capitis is again two that is black dot and grey patch. Black dot and grey patch. So these are the examples of non-inflammatory type of tinea capitis. Now let us go back to the MCQ. They simply asked you inflammatory alopecia which one is the most common. So the answer is pretty direct. If you know the classification, the answer is there. That is Kirion and Favors. Kirion and Favors. So moving to the next one. A patient presents to you with multiple anogenital warts. The biopsy of these lesions showed squamous atypia. Which of the following human papilloma virus types are considered to be a high risk? Now, first question is, anogenital warts are also called as, what is the other name of anogenital warts? I'll give you two options. Is it condyloma lata or is it condyloma acuminata? So, so most of you are answering this MCQ as B. Now, before we go into B, tell me what is the other name of anogenital warts? Anogenital warts are also called as condyloma acuminata. Acuminata. So, very good. 
So Priya, Donald, all of you are answering. This is going to be called as condyloma acuminata. Then in which disease do we find condyloma lata? That is also there in the chat box. So condyloma lata is seen in secondary syphilis. So condyloma lata is seen in secondary syphilis. Now, usually condyloma acuminata is caused by HPV 6 and 11. HPV 6 and 11. Both these 6 and 11 is considered to be a high risk or a low risk type. So both of them are considered to be a low risk HPV. But the examiner is now testing you asking like which is considered to be the high risk of H HPV. So high risk of HPV is going to be HPV 18. <coughs> it is going to be HPV 18. Very good. So Kishore Kumar, low risk is 6 and 11, Neelam Bhatia, Priya Thakur. Very good. All of you are answering. Ion Donald, Richpal, Ayuvraj. Excellent. So I am proceeding to the next one. Okay, with your permission. Now see this question. A farmer presents to you with a swelling on the foot and multiple discharging sinus in the lower limb. Granules from the discharge were examined under the microscope which is shown below. Now which of the following is true regarding the condition? Now you have a farmer. Farmer is having a swelling over the foot. And over the swelling, there is multiple discharging sinus. And from this discharging sinus, what is coming out? Some granules are coming out of the sinus. Now, does it ring a bell? What is this triad? This is a triad of mycetoma, isn't it? Dravidan, Richpal, Kishore, Dipanshu, all of you are right. So, now let us see, before going into the options, let us see one of the image. The patient usually presents with a swollen foot. It can be usually the swollen ankle, isn't it? Or foot. So there are multiple discharging sinus as well. Discharging sinus. <coughs> yes. And there are grains that is discharged out of these sinus. So if we send these grains for an examination, it can either come back positive for a bacteria or a fungus. Bacteria or fungus. So in case this comes back positive as a bacteria, what do we call it as? <coughs> I agree all these things are uh, examples of mycetoma. So in case it comes back positive as a bacteria, is it eumycetoma or actinomycetoma? Yes. This is called as actinomycetoma. Whereas in case it comes back positive for a fungus like Madurella mycetomatis, then you call it as a eumycetoma. You call it as a eumycetoma. Now all of you understood, right? It is usually a farmer. There is a swelling of the ankle. So in the swelling of the ankle, there are multiple openings over the skin. And these are the sinuses. So through the sinus what is coming out, you can see a macroscopic grains that comes out. And these macroscopic grains, if you send them for investigation, it can come positive as a bacteria or fungus. If it is bacteria, we call it as actinomycetoma. If it is fungus, we call it as eumycetoma. Together, we call it as mycetoma or madura foot. So the diagnosis is madura foot. Okay, the color, sometimes the color also, it can be either uh, yellowish where the sulfur content is there, sometimes blackish color, it can give you some diagnostic clue, but the exact diagnosis can come only after doing a KOH investigation as well as a culture and sensitivity, <coughs> as well as a culture, fine. So in this, the right answer would be both bacteria and fungus can be the causative. So here the right answer would be both bacteria and fungus can be the causative. So if it is bacterial, treat it with antibiotics. If it is fungal, go for antifungal therapy. That is about Madura foot. Now, <coughs> you mycetoma, yeah. In the chat box, all of you have answered it right. So I'm just proceeding with the next one. Yes. So now go, going to the next one. Again, it is a farmer. See, what happens in almost all of this deep fungal infection is, it is usually seen in farmers. So the MCQ also, it is mentioned as a farmer. 
The second one is it is how does somebody acquire a deep fungal infection? Somebody acquires a deep fungal infection by traumatic implantation of the fungus. So deep fungal infection it is usually due to traumatic implantation of the fungus. So now let us see this question. A farmer presents to you with a cauliflower shaped mass. Now it is a cauliflower. So which is present over the foot after and developed after a minor injury. Matlab traumatic implantation of the fungus has been done. Now microscopy shows copper penny bodies. Very typical. Copper penny bodies. What is the likely diagnosis? So in the chat box answer is like A, 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 A that is chromoblastomycosis. Excellent. So chromoblastomycosis because in chromoblastomycosis what do you find? So these are the cauliflower like lesions in one of the cases of chromoblastomycosis. So here what you find is cauliflower lesions and the histopathology can reveal copper penny bodies and the other names of copper penny bodies also please remember this is also called as medlar bodies it's also called as sclerotic bodies or muriform cells or muriform cells so cauliflower lesions copper penny bodies medlar bodies muriform cells sclerotic bodies all these are seen in chromoblastomycosis so this image is chromoblastomycosis. Now answer me for, for this diagnosis of this first image. Suppose it is a gardener who comes to you with complaints of multiple nodules over the upper limb. And you can see that these nodules they are arranged in a linear fashion. Okay, which gives you a hint that this is running along a lymphatics. Now, what is the diagnosis? Yes, Neelam Bhatia is saying sporotrix shenkai and here the diagnosis is sporotrichosis. Here the diagnosis is sporotrichosis. So, Swasti, Neelam, Priya, Oinla, Oinraj, Mohit, all of you are answering. This is porotrichosis. This is usually seen in a rose gardener. It is also called as a rose gardener disease. Okay, this is a, also called as a rose gardener's disease where you can find linear arrangement of nodules that is present along a lymphatics. Linear arrangement of nodules along a lymphatics. Linear arrangement of nodules along lymphatics fine super so in all these cases of deep fungal infections how can you treat chromoblastomycosis and how can you treat sporotrichosis you can treat the drug of choice in both these cases would be itraconazole so in both these cases the treatment can be with itraconazole so for a minimum period of six months treatment may be necessary Okay, and can somebody tell me one more point here? In sporotrichosis, what is a typical histopathology finding? What is the finding? Because in chromoblastomycosis, we spoke about muriform cells, copper penny bodies. Abhi isme, Drabidin is answering. So this is asteroid bodies. Asteroid bodies are seen. Okay, asteroid bodies, these are star-shaped bodies that you can see in histopathology. The of sporotrichosis. Okay, very good. So Kishore, Maxwell, all of you are answering it right. So now let's go to the next one. Ian Donald is also answering. Very good. So now let's speak about the next question. That is a patient presents with an anesthetic patch. So whenever there is an anesthetic patch, the, the diagnosis that comes to our mind is leprosy. So for not the first point. Now in the areas of the face as it is shown in the image below. Which of the following nerves is most commonly involved in this condition? See, what is happening is, don't generalize it to leprosy. They have given an image and they are asking you in this patient, which is the most common nerve that may be involved. 
so this may be confusing for someone the reason for this confusion is yeah some of them are saying facial and some of them are saying it as trigeminal nerve see remember that there are three types of mcqs that is possible the first thing is which is the most common peripheral nerve involved in leprosy so what is the most common peripheral nerve that is involved in leprosy anyone peripheral nerve i'm not asking cranial nerve i'm asking about peripheral nerve now so in peripheral nerve the most common nerve is going to be the ulnar nerve it is going to be the ulnar nerve now what is the most common cranial nerve involved in leprosy the most common cranial nerve that may be involved in leprosy is going to be facial nerve it is going to be facial nerve now even the examiner knows that everybody knows about the most common peripheral nerve and the most common cranial nerve that is involved now they have given you an image of a hypoanesthetic patch over the face in which this is present in this region where a nerve can be split into three ophthalmic maxillary mandibular now what is the nerve that is more likely to be involved here now the options are abducens nuclei facial nerve optic nerve trigeminal nerve now what is the right answer now now here it is going to be trigeminal nerve according to this image okay according to this image but in case they ask you generally what is the most common nerve that is the most common cranial nerve the answer would be facial nerve fine so moving to the next one i think this is again a repeat see all these are the previous year questions so did you notice that kirion was repeated multiple times not the same question but in different forms now this is also repeated okay now what is this patient presented with a body mass index of 30 kg per m square presents to you with a lesion over the neck and which of the following condition is she most likely to be suffering from so hypothyroidism metabolic syndrome addison's disease hyperparathyroidism so all of you know of this here the diagnosis is acanthosis nigricans acanthosis nigricans and in acanthosis nigricans you can see a hyperpigmented velvety skin over the body folds especially over the neck as well as the axillary area so today during our discussion i told you what is the most common association the most common association is with obesity so along with obesity there are many other causes as well what are the other causes which you already know diabetes can be a cause patients can be having pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome along with that metabolic syndrome x isn't it now please remember one more very important point because it was once asked as well now rarely it is associated with malignancy so rarely it can be associated with malignancy also especially gi adenocarcinoma so especially gi adenocarcinoma it can be an association as well fine so all these are about the points regarding acanthosis nigricans so good going so now let's go to the next one irregular pitting of the nails with subungual hyperkeratosis see as we go further questions are getting repeated isn't it so that is why pyqs are very important so where did we learn about irregular pitting <coughs> so irregular pitting of the nails we discussed in psoriasis subungual hyperkeratosis also we discussed in psoriasis so this is going to be psoriasis Okay, this is going to be a psoriasis question done so in alopecia areata what is the type of pitting that you can see regular and shallow pits now here it is going to be psoriasis so that was a direct question see please try to remember the findings in psoriasis the nail findings in psoriasis as poison what is poison p stands for pitting of the nails O I that is oil drop sign. S stands for subungual hyperkeratosis, and O stands for onycholysis, and N stands for nail plate dystrophy. Nail plate dystrophy. So remember poison for the nail findings in psoriasis. Okay, pitting, oil drop, subungual hyperkeratosis, onycholysis, and nail plate dystrophy. 
So going to the next one. So a 35 year old woman presents with complaints of a hair loss for the past three months. So a lady is having a hair loss for the last three months and she has been tested positive for COVID-19 few months ago, let us say eight months ago. What is the most likely diagnosis? Options are tinea capitis, telogen effluvium, trichotillomania, female pattern androgenic alopecia. Female pattern androgenic alopecia. So what is the answer? Dipanshu, I'll talk about the blood vessel point. One moment. So most of them are answering it as B. Very good. So why it is B? Because it is happening after three months. So if you all remember that in the hair cycle, so we had learned about the hair cycle, isn't it? So there are three phases in the hair cycle. The first phase is called as the anagen phase. So in the anagen phase, 85% of our hair is in anagen phase. And this is something that lasts for three years, isn't it? Whereas the second phase is called as the catagen phase, which is less important for us because it is just a transition phase where only one percentage of hair is in catagen phase and it lasts for three weeks. And the third phase is called as the telogen phase. And this telogen phase, let us for the ease of remembering, we can keep it as 15% of hair is in telogen phase and it lasts for three months. And it lasts for three months. So this is three years, three weeks and three months. That is anagen, catagen, telogen. A, C, T. Okay, three years, three weeks and three months. Now, what happens in telogen effluvium? So what happens in telogen effluvium? So this time in the MCQ, they gave you an example of COVID-19 infection. Remember what is the most common association of telogen effluvium? You can remember it as stress. So anything that makes you stressful can lead to a hair loss. If you are very much stressed about the NEED PG 2023, after a few weeks, what are you going to experience? You are going to experience a lot of hair loss. What is this hair loss? This hair loss is called as telogen effluvium. So the examples of this stress can be anemia, it can be pregnancy, it can be infections. So all these are going to be examples of a stressful state in the body. So the example would be telogen effluvium. Now can you tell me what is the example of anagen effluvium? So in the cases of anagen effluvium, what is going to be the commonest example? What is the most common association? Why will a patient lose 85% of the hair, which is in the growth phase? What is attacking the growth phase of the hair and what is the example? Yes, the example here is going to be <coughs> chemotherapy. Very good Neelam. So this is going to be chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So these are going to be the examples of anagen effluvium where a patient who is taking chemotherapy, the chemotherapeutic agents will go and arrest the anagen phase. So when there is an anagen phase arrest, what happens? The anagen hair will fall off and this is called as anagen effluvium. So please keep all these examples in mind. So Aryan was asking diagnosis of hyperhidrosis. See hyperhidrosis means there is an increased sweating, isn't it? There is an increased sweating over the body. So that is called as hyperhidrosis. Now just coming back to this question. So whenever there is an infection and after infection of three months period, the patient is complaining of hair loss. So the correct answer here would be telogen effluvium. So I think that is it. So we have covered almost uh, all the PYQs of the past few years and uh, I was expecting a short break in between but it was nice, the flow was good. So all of you were very much responsive in the chat box. So if you would like to know anything about some of the any other important topics in dermatology, I'll be happy to discuss the same. And if there is anything that is not clear for you, I can explain it as well. 
so i'll just see the chat box once so dipanshu was asking regarding the blood vessel point in uh, psoriasis so i'll just add a page one moment yeah see in psoriasis there is a sign so just coming back to this blood vessel point so i believe that he is asking about auspit sign so in auspit sign what happens once you repeatedly scrape over the lesions you can see these pin pointed bleeding spots isn't it so these spin pointed bleeding spots that develop over the plaque when you scrape over the lesions in psoriasis it is called as the auspit sign and why what is the reason behind this auspit sign because there is a supra papillary thinning that is visible in histopathological examination so there is a supra papillary thinning that happens so the dermal wet blood vessels what happens they come quite in the superficial area of the skin so once you scrape what happens you can see multiple pin pointed bleeding spots as well so thank you vishal for this feedback and is there anything that we would like to discuss today yes mohit is asking regarding this uh, genital ulcer disease so that is a good question as well so in genital ulcer disease remember i'll give you a nice mnemonic which you can remember to easily crack these questions on genital ulcers so remember the always in genital ulcer disease they may ask you regarding either a painful or a painless ulcer they may ask you regarding a painless genital ulcer or a painful genital ulcer so you can remember this painless genital ulcer by the name or a mnemonic of a drug that is lsd so just imagine that if you take a drug will you get to know the pain obviously no isn't it so lsd means lymphogranuloma venerum that is lgv s stands for syphilis and d stands for donovanosis so these are the examples of painless genital ulcer remember lsd so lsd means painless genital ulcer whereas the remaining ones is going to be herpes genitalis and chancroid and chancroid so if the mcq says a patient presented with a painful genital ulcer and then blah 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 so whatever they may mention painful genital ulcer means you are going to rule out lgv lsd and donovanosis and the right answer is the last one fine so regarding the characteristics of the ulcer and all that is going to be a much more longer thing but remember painless and painful as of now fine so thank you so much uh, sudha healthy pill nida patel neelam batia so once again uh, at pw our sprint series is not yet over so tomorrow we have uh, psychiatry session by dr dharmendra sir so at the same time at 6:30 pm onwards and i hope all of you have gone through the grant test because today morning we started the grant test and this grant test paper will be available till tomorrow or day after tomorrow so please make sure that you utilize the grant test as well so today as well as 23rd and 26th we have this grant test by uh, pw medet so this will give you a real time examination scenario and please try to solve all the mcqs by yourself so don't miss out on these three grant test as well so once again uh so dr dipanshu was asking regarding wood slam see dr dipanshu uh, regarding wood slam yes that is an instrument that is used in dermatological investigations the common findings like sometimes the skin may reflect back with some colors like greenish fluorescence reddish fluorescence etc so along with the annotated pdf i will also try to add the wood slam findings for you so you can have it a easily reading as well fine so please uh, you can get this annotated pdf in the telegram group of medet uh, pw medet and we'll be sending it to you shortly so once again thank you so much for the patience so please uh, join the telegram group and you'll be getting the annotated pdf and once again wishing all of you all the success wishing you all the best for neat pg 2023 thank you for your patience and thank you for this listening without a break thank you